from Muskogee, Oklahoma, and proud of it, was the sassy reply I gave at the age of three to anyone inquiring where I was from. So I had pride of heritage and pride of beginnings even then, and that is as it should be. My Polish grandfather, Frank Xavier Lekowski, settled in Oklahoma and married Sonora E. McIntosh of the Creek Indian Nation. Grandmother Sonora was the daughter of John McIntosh, one of the first missionaries to the Western tribes of the Plains Indians. I am told that there is a marker to his name some six miles north of Anadarko as a tribute to John as a missionary to his own people. John McIntosh's father was Colonel Chili McIntosh, descendant of General William McIntosh, who was chief of the Lower Creeks in Georgia. My father, James Boyd Lakowski, was the third of five children born to the Lakowskis and was the only one who took after the Polish side. On a trip to Muskogee in 1972, I spent a delightful afternoon with my grandmother's brother, Joby McIntosh, who brought out a number of family albums for me to view. I was highly amused that in of all the family gatherings with the Indian ladies in their high-collared dresses and the children in their button-up shoes and Sunday go-to-meeting pants and dresses, there was but one towhead in the group, my father. My brother, James Boyd, Jr., and I also took from the blonde Polish side. But interestingly enough, I have a son who my Indian relatives tell me looks just like my Uncle Frank, continuity of the Indian heritage in my own children and their father is Saudi Arabian. The dictionary defines life as, quote, something essential to the continued existence of something else. So we get life from those who went before and we pass it on to those who follow and that is fascinating and exciting. It does get a bit intricate at times, this business of passing on received heritages though. My daughter Nadia's sons are through their father, direct descendants of the Arabian Islamic prophet Muhammad and on my side, they are also direct descendants of General William McIntosh, Creek Indian Chief. Although my beginnings were in Oklahoma, I left there at an early age with my parents, uh, James Boyd and Martha Ann Gosling Lakowski, in a cross-country trip in the new 1924 T-Model Ford to California where I grew up and had all of my schooling. Now, my claim to fame is due to the fact that I lived in Saudi Arabia, not as an American, but as a good, veiled, secluded Arabian wife. I met my Arab husband at the University of California at Berkeley. Pretty good indication, I think, that even in my day, strange things happened at Berkeley. We met in, of all places, a paleontology class on a field trip one day where I had slipped and fallen on the wet rocks and this tall, dark, handsome Arab named Ali Abdullah Ali Reza came and literally picked me up. I had a date with him within the hour and then we dated for two years and then began to talk of marriage. What that really means is that we began to talk of the problems involved if we were to marry. Ali is a Muslim, I am a Christian, our respective countries, especially back in the early 40s when we were dating, had totally different lifestyles, and environments, and cultures. And there was the problem of getting our respective families to accept and to bless our marriage. But the day it came, however, when Ali could formally propose, and on my engagement night, my young ears heard again what life in Arabia would mean for me. Bailed and secluded, I would not have the freedom to come and go. I would not be able to enjoy any public social life with my husband because men and women do not mix in public socially in Saudi Arabia. I would have to live in what we call nowadays the extended family. I would have to live with my widowed mother-in-law in her home, with her, my brother-in-law, my sisters-in-law, my nieces, my nephews, the old women of the family, the servants, the slaves, because slavery was still a way of life in Arabia of those days. The city in which we would live was now at the time electrified. Water was in short supply. About every disease you can think of was prevalent. And with that, the people knew little of disease and how it spread. And there were no medical facilities and no qualified doctors. There would be for me no going downtown to shop, no meeting anyone downtown for lunch, no going to the coiffure, 
no driving a car, no picnics in the park, no park, in fact. There was one lone tree in Jeddah, at the city where we would live in those days. Also, one might ask, how could anyone in their right mind say yes to all of that? And my answer to that is, that's easy. All you have to do is be young and in love and not really thinking. It's quite remarkable. I think that youth has this naive confidence in itself because if youth didn't, so many things would not happen. So I, being young and in love, said yes anyway. And after living in Berkeley for two years, I was went along much as any university couples would. Two things happened which changed our lives. The first was the birth of our first child, a daughter, Hamida, which means praiseworthy in Arabic. And about three weeks after Hamida's birth, when a cable was delivered to our door very early one morning. The cable was signed Abdul Aziz. Now Abdul Aziz was the old desert warrior of royal birth who had come out of the exile imposed on his family in the Arabian Peninsula in generations past and had, in the first quarter of the century, reconquered about four-fifths of the lands comprising the Arabian Peninsula and consolidated them under his central authority into the Arabia of Saud, or Saudi Arabia. And in the cable that was sent to my husband, he appointed Ali, then still an undergraduate at Berkeley, as a delegate to the San Francisco Peace Conference of 1945, the forerunner of the United Nations, where the Charter was formed. And it was very awesome for us as young people to have a direct part in this great world effort for peace. And it was tremendously exciting when from all over the world the various delegations started arriving. Without a doubt, the most exciting delegation was the delegation from Saudi Arabia. Stepping off the plane, looking like figures out of a history book, were five sons of the king, their aides, their secretaries, and two Nubian bodyguards. The whole town was agog with excitement at this colorful looking group as they wore their long dresses, their camel's wool cloaks, their headdresses, and the two Nubian bodyguards had the gold swords and the daggers and the crossed cartridge belts and the rifles. There wasn't a hostess in town who wouldn't have given her eye teeth to entertain them. I, over in Berkeley, didn't have that problem because in their off moments from their conference meetings, the entire group, the five princes, the aides, the secretaries, the two Nubian bodyguards, one of whom, by the way, was the former chief palace executioner and had lopped off many heads in his day, would cross the Bay Bridge and suddenly pull up in all their glory at my very humble Berkeley door. For the first time then, my life took on a magic carpet flavor. I could look around at any given moment and see nothing but Arabs dressed in their ancient robes, hear nothing but the language of Arabic, and for the first time feel that I was really part of Arabia. It was as if Arabia had come to me in the person of the delegation members before I had gone to Arabia. And my first trip to Arabia had a magic carpet flavor because at the end of the conference, the head of that delegation, who is now the King of Arabia, His Majesty King Faisal, he was then His Royal Highness Prince Faisal, told Ali, my husband, that he had done a great job and that he didn't want him to return to university. He wanted him instead to come and work for him in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he wanted us to leave with the delegation as they returned to their homeland. Thus it was that I, thinking I had two more years in Berkeley, two years in which I had planned to learn the Arabic language, and two years that I had hoped to become more accustomed to the idea that Arabia was to be my life, I suddenly found myself actually on my way. My infant daughter and I, then four and a half months old, were the only females in this entire group of be-robed, be-headdressed Arabs as we went from Berkeley to New York, crossed the Atlantic on a blacked-out ship, the Queen Mary, to London, thence to Cairo, and finally on the last leg of our trip to the Red Sea port of Jeddah, which was to be my home for 13 years. As our plane was coming across the Red Sea coast and circling to ready to land, Ali and I were in the back of the plane, and he turns to me at this point, and he says, Marianne, it's time to get your veil on. That was my moment of truth. It had been so easy in Berkeley to say, certainly I'll wear the veil, certainly I'll cloak my person. But now the moment had come when I would have to veil my face and my person from any man outside of the Ali Reza family. 
As I got out the black piece of material that constitutes the veil in Arabia, my companions of many months caught sight of me, and within seconds a great wave of hilarity spread over the plain. Somehow they found it extremely amusing that I, the American, was going to their country, and they had been with me in mine, and we'd been halfway across the world with my bare face hanging out, and suddenly I was going to have to veil from them. As I set foot on Arabia sands, and the heat and humidity was almost a physical impact, and a hand came out of somewhere to guide me to a car, to get me into it, to slam the door and drive off with me. My first thought was, well, I'm the first Christian and the first Western girl to come and live here as a member of one of its families, and someone just doesn't like that idea. I was convinced that I was to be taken off into the desert and beheaded or disappear, but actually that was not so. It was just one of our Ali Reza drivers who had been told to get me out of public view as quickly as possible, and he did a great job. He got me out of there in record time. Driving across the sands, for there were no roads in Arabia in those days, to our family home, which was but one of three structures outside the still-walled city of Jeddah. There was our house that my brother-in-law had built just the year before my husband and I went. There was the American legation a bit closer to the Red Sea in front of us. And there was a tower of rocks and a pile of stones that had been known in that ancient land from ages past as the Tomb of Eve. In fact, the name Jeddah, the name of the town where I lived in Arabia, means in Arabic grandmother, because the grandmother of us all is supposedly buried there. Of course, when I had a good look at Arabia and this dark, barren, desolate surroundings, I told Ali later, no way this could once have been the Garden of Eden. The driver drove me through the gate of our walled-in compound, around to the steps of the house, where my mother-in-law, a lady I did not know, and a woman with whom I could not converse, came down the steps to greet me. And by the way she took me in her arms, I knew at least that I was warmly welcomed and that she loved me. And that was a big plus for me at that moment. But when she took me up the steps and across the terrace and past the mosaic fountain, things we always tend to think of when we think of Arabia, they were all there, and into what we called Odus Shahi, the tea room, where the women of Arabia traditionally spend their days, I was quite unprepared for what I saw. On the floor to the right was a big brass bubbling samovar with one of our slave girls tending it. Around the room were the high upholstered benches on which the ladies of Arabia spend their days. There were wall hangings and articles of gold and brass and silver, beautiful carpet on the floor, wrought iron on the windows, and on the benches, what must have been half of the townswomen of Jeddah. Hospitality. Hospitality is the prime current in the lives of the Arabs, and these women had come to greet the newcomer. I think curiosity had something to do with it, too. But there they were, dressed differently, made up differently, quaffed differently, and I didn't even know how to greet them properly. I was trying in my open American way to give them a good hearty handshake. Just my luck, they don't shake hands in Arabia. They touch fingertips and kiss the fingertips that have touched yours to seal the greeting. And there I was, trying to shake, and they trying to touch and kiss, and we had a big tug of war as I continued rounds of the room. By then, someone had brought my baby in, my beautiful baby. I know, some will say that's the mother speaking, and actually, you know, the Arabs have an old proverb that says, the monkey in the eyes of its mother is a gazelle. But I still say my baby was quite pretty, but these ladies were looking at her, shaking their heads, clucking their tongues, and appearing to say, poor thing, which indeed they were saying, mesquina, poor thing. And I thought, what's with them? Why are they looking at her like that when she's such a pretty baby? But this was just one of the many superstitions, customs, traditions that I did not know that first day in Arabia. These women had a strong belief in the evil eye, and if they had looked at her and said quite honestly, what a pretty baby, the evil eye would hear and come and do harm to this thing of beauty. Whereas if the evil eye hears them say it's already a poor thing, it won't bother. This was their way of protecting my baby. But occasionally that first day in Arabia, I would have to leave the room just to try and get some semblance of reality back into my thoughts. And I would go upstairs to the third floor to our rooms and look out of the window, and that didn't help a bit because there on the desert, just outside of our walls, were Bedouins encamped, and they were living in the same black goat hair tents and wearing the same clothes, 
and using the same tools and utensils that my Old Testament very aptly describes. Since women from outside the family were there, our men could not be around that first day in Arabia, but I got through it thinking, well, at least I'll be by my side for the rest of the time, but that was not to be so. He was ordered on to the inner capital of Riyadh by the old king for what was supposed to have been a four-day absence, but as it turned out, I spent my first three weeks in Arabia without him. He left that first morning at dawn, and as the morning progressed, I heard a commotion in our yard, and my brother-in-law came to tell me that that was a caravan forming to convey me to the mountain town of Taif, where the rest of the Ali Reza family were waiting to greet me. When I look back on my thoughts of that day and the feeling of strangeness that had almost overcome me, I think now, by golly, I caused them a bit of excitement, too. Normally, that caravan that was to take us to the mountain town of Taif would have gone on the regular road, which led through the holy city of Mecca. But Mecca is closed to non-Muslims, and they had a Christian, me, in its midst. So all because of me, the entire caravan had to bypass Mecca and take a road that probably hadn't been used since King Solomon's day. As a result, the entire caravan got lost and bogged down on the sand and bounced out of commission, and it took them 11 hours to go on a trip that for them would have been an easy four or five hour one. I made no brownie points that day. My progress in Arabic those first few weeks in Arabia was nil because I very promptly got very sick. Have you ever tried to be sick in a foreign language? And at the end of two weeks of fever and delirium, I certainly hadn't made much progress in Arabic and it was just about then that they told us one morning that we, the harim of the House of Ali Reza, the women, go to pay a visit to the favorite wife of the king. Now the king used to come down every year prior to the pilgrimage to Mecca and encamp in the desert above Mecca. And if I had thought up to that point that I had stepped back into another culture and another time, just from London to Cairo and then from Cairo to Jeddah even farther back, I can say that the trip to the king's camp in the desert above Taif was like something out of Arabian Nights. As we sat there in tents on the desert in the middle of nowhere were several hundred people, and in the tents, beautiful carpets laid right on the desert sand, and all of the trappings that we think of when we think just the name Arabia. And as we Ali Reza women sat in the favorite wife's tent, the old king had over 200 wives during his lifetime, so you can imagine how important the favorite one was, going through the traditional symbols of hospitality, the serving of coffee primarily, serving of date pastries, pomegranate juice, and at lunchtime being taken by a slave girl to another tent where we were served a whole lamb, great steaming platters of rice. After lunch, a communal drinking cup was passed from which we all had to sip. At moments like these, I would inquire with my eyes to my sister-in-law, do I have to? And the answer always came back, yes. Then what I thought was the topper of the day was when a slave girl came in with a great fuming incense burner and we were to waft the incense over our person. And properly, the aroma of the incense remains on the clothing for at least two or three weeks afterwards. But the topper came when a lady-in-waiting informed us that the king himself had heard of our presence in his camp and had commanded us to audience that afternoon. Now, this was a very special privilege, you must remember, because the men and women do not mix in socially in Saudi Arabia. By the king's wish, the king's command, and at the appointed hour, a lady-in-waiting took us to the king's tent. And as we stood outside preparing to go in, my relatives conveyed to me by sign language, I guess, that I would have to kiss the king's hand, as was the custom. I'd never kissed anyone's hand in my life, but I told them, you lead and I'll follow. I would have to follow anyway, because another old tradition and custom in Arabia is that the elder go first in thought and in action, so that my mother-in-law, being the eldest, went in first, my sisters-in-law, my cousins, and finally the tag end, the youngest, myself. And so looking like so many trick-or-treaters, we filed into the royal tent to greet the king, and in our veils and cloaks, sat down in little huddled lumps of black on the carpet, on the sand. We could still see the ripples of the sand underneath the carpet. 
and then started the traditional formulas of greeting and response, formulas that have come down through the ages unvarying. And I only knew one reply to when the king would address me and say, Kif Hali, how are you? I knew enough to say, thanks be to God, because in Arabia, no matter what state of health you're in, you can always reply, thanks be to God. So I sat there under my veil, waiting for my turn, which came, and I replied, probably a little more fervently than usual, because I thought that ended my conversational duties for the day. And then the audience was over, and we filed out in the order in which we had come in. But by the time I reached His Majesty, my relatives had done their obeisance and had disappeared outside of the tent flap, and I was alone with this great figure of an Arabian king. He was almost six foot five, so he was indeed a majestic figure. And then, to my utter horror, he said something else to me. Well, I'd used my one good phrase, and I didn't know what he'd said, but I knew I had to reply. Palace protocol and common decency, if nothing else, would require an answer. So my adult brain tried to remember, out of the weeks that I had been sick, some of the expressions that I had heard most frequently. I figured that if I had heard them often enough, they might just fit here. And finally, one of the expressions I had heard quite frequently came to me. I uttered it, and I stumbled out into the sunlight. Mercifully, then, we were taken home. And later on that evening, Ali came in to where we ladies were sitting in our quarters on the third floor. And by the time he reached the door of our room, he was already laughing so hard he could hardly stand up. He yelled across at me, What did you do in the king's camp today? I said, I don't know. What did I do in the king's camp today? And apparently it was all over Arabia what Ali Reza's American wife had told the king and audience that day because his majesty himself had told the story in his evening audience, which is open to all the men of Arabia, all of the desert sheiks, all of the chieftains, all of the royal family, all of the merchants, any Arabian man within a radius of a hundred miles somehow gets to the king's evening audience when he's in the area. And the king had gotten such a kick out of my reply that he had told the story himself. And what had happened was that his majesty, knowing very well that I'm a Christian, and knowing equally well that I had not learned the language yet, had told me in parting, we hope you become a Muslim. And by a mere fluke, truly a mere fluke, I had given the one and only perfect answer, for my reply was, if God wills it. Well, apparently God didn't will it, because I never did become a Muslim. I kept my faith. I respected theirs. They respected mine. It was a beautiful lesson to me in human tolerance and respect one for the other. And it was in such things as this that the compensations came for me, of course. People have asked me since my book came out, how could you, an educated, freedom-loving, independent American girl, go and live in a land where the women are so isolated, where the activities are limited to what I like to call the cycles of life, being born, growing up, marrying, having children, dying. Their lives were no different than their mothers' lives had been and their grandmothers and on the generations before that. They were not educated in the Western sense, but they were certainly experts in the field of human relations. I had many, many experiences in Arabia, of course, plenty that made me laugh, at least in retrospect, plenty that made me cry, I can tell you. Some that made me and some that broke me. But the great experience that I had in learning hard learning at first to be a person with other people was the rewarding factor. I came to know that no matter on what part of the earth you lay your head, there are certain values that hold true. Concern, kindness, give and take, sharing, belonging, respect one for the other, and love. And isn't that what it's all about? To live as they did. And I learned the language. And as I became fluent, could share with these women the life that I had held before I went to Arabia. The fact that I had gone through college, that I had held jobs, that I had put myself through the university, 
that I could drive a car, that I could ride a horse, things totally inconceivable to them. Turn could tell me tales of old Arabia and share some of the marvelous heritage of oral literature that has come down through the centuries. I had long since made my peace with Arabia, when after 15 years of marriage and five children, my husband Ali had another woman in tow and divorced me to marry her. Of course, a Muslim can have up to four wives legally at a time, but I'm sure Ali divorced me because he knew I would not be content to be a sloughed off first wife. Under Muslim law, a divorced mother has no right to her children after they are seven, and I had at the time four over seven and one under seven. My four were taken for me for a period of over a year, and I did then what I like to call exchange my cloak and veil for cloak and dagger. To get to keep my children, I had to involve myself twice, as a matter of fact, in highly complicated, finely meshed plans to escape with them and get them to America at least get to raise them through their formative years. But then some other Arabian customs I thought I'd never have to deal personally with came to the fore as my two daughters at the ages of 16 and 17 were married to their first cousins. This son Faisal, however, married his American girlfriend just like his father did. So here we go again. Interesting to think back on that marriage, especially in the light of the present accent on ecumenicity, because when Faisal, my son, married, he's a Muslim, as all of my children are. His bride was raised a Catholic, and the man who married them is my first cousin, my kissing cousin from Oklahoma, Dr. Earl Riley, a Baptist minister. A cousin of mine, Dr. Riley, had much more time in Oklahoma as I did, than I did, because he grew up there, and it might be remembered that he became the first Indian president of Bacon College. My second Arabian son, Tariq, who looks like his Indian uncle Frank, is an architect and working at this speaking in London. My youngest son is still in school in Switzerland, but will also get his university training in a California university. It perhaps may sound naive, but I am quite sincere when I say that I don't believe I fully realize how special my life in Arabia had been until after I left Arabia. That first year without my children, I was living in Rome. In the effort to get back into Western society, I would attend embassy gatherings and get-togethers of some of the American colony in Rome. And when, in the course of conversation, people would ask me where I had been and what I had done, and I would tell them, and I would see their eyes open and their jaws drop, I got to thinking, well, that is pretty unique. And it was while I was still living in Europe and before my escape with my children that I began to write my story. Then with my escapes and the need to get a job, that was fun, hiring in for a job. They want your past job record. What are you going to put, ex-harem wife? The business of keeping home and family together. I did not have time for writing and indeed almost forgot about the chapters that I had finalized. Until one year I was on a sales trip in Europe for a company for which I was working and I swung by Switzerland to visit my youngest son who was still in school there. And an old friend gave me a dinner party and at the dinner party was the renowned economist, ex-ambassador and professor at Harvard, Kenneth Galbraith. Someone had told him, I think, before dinner that I had lived in Arabia, and he expressed great interest in it, and in fact kept me talking all through dinner. And at the end of dinner, he said, my goodness, you should write this story. Then I remembered, and I said, well, as a matter of fact, I have eight chapters about done. And he said, when you get back to the States, Xerox your chapters and send them to me. I'd be very interested in reading them. So you don't turn down interest like that. And I did just that. I Xeroxed the eight chapters, sent them off to Ambassador Galbraith at Harvard University, and very soon had a letter back from him saying that he had read it with great interest and had sent them to his publishers. Very soon then, I had a letter from the executive editor of Houghton Mifflin, 
saying they were fascinated with my story? Did I have any more work done? And if I did, to send it along and tell them what was to come. I have writer friends who say they'll never forgive me. They papered their walls with rejection slips, and I stepped right into it. It was really a matter of being at the right place at the right time. And life is full of experiences like that. I would not like anyone to think that I am through with Arabia or it with me. I am still very much a part of it. I meet with my Arabian in-laws wherever and whenever I can. I spent two glorious months in London with about 30 of the Ali Reza good guys, and London will never be the same. I was in Beirut last year with my two sisters-in-law, the two with whom I lived all those years in Arabia. And we had grand, glorious times, living our memories and living new ones. Standing invitation from the Queen of Arabia, who told me in Geneva a couple of years ago, when the children in Arabia, you come and stay with us, and I'm just human enough to want to do that one of these days. The Arabia of today, of course, is not the Arabia to which I went in the mid-40s. With the coming of oil and the discovery that Arabia stands were practically floating on oil, and then the subsequent development of that oil, Arabia has changed in the decades since. Perhaps I can best explain it by repeating what my American daughter-in-law wrote to me after her first two weeks in Arabia after she and my son were married. She wrote to me and said, guess what I'm doing? I'm reading your book again, except I have a new title for it. Manual for Daily Living in Saudi Arabia. Yes, yes, she says, now we have air conditioning, beautiful buildings, schools, hospitals, clinics, tree-lined streets, transportation system, telephones. These are electrified. Water is no longer a pro problem. But, she says, the customs for women are not all that changed because the women of Arabia are still veiled. I have a real message for the women's libras of today. They just don't know how good they have it. However, girls can now go to school. The first school for girls opened in 1960. And in the past decade or so, the Saudi Arabian government has put some of its tremendous oil revenues into the field of education. They know that their hope lies in education. And as a matter of fact, the government totally subsidizes any Saudi subject who wishes and has the ability to study abroad at the university of his choice. His airfare, his tuition, his book, his living allowance, clothing allowance are all paid by the Saudi Arabian government, and this means boys and girls. The first school for girls opened in 1960 in Arabia. Like as it was, it's a start, and in the years to come, Many of the younger women of Arabia will be going abroad to study and returning with their knowledge and their professions to take their part in Arabian society. I always think of the women of Arabia. I think of the lack of opportunities as we know them. But I think always of their vitality, of their humor. When everything else failed, we laughed. And of their marvelous ability to communicate and to form a community. Arabia has put one foot in the 20th century, but it still has far to go. And I am proud that my sons will no doubt have a part in the betterment of that land. I know that my children, all of them, are enormously proud of their American heritage. And I like to think be proud of them. Speaking for myself, I had a great opportunity to lead a unique life. People have often asked me, all things considered, would you do it again? And my reply is, I wouldn't have missed it for anything. It is true, I think, that everything we do becomes a part of us, as what we are to begin with is a part of us. In the course of thinking about my beginnings and where I've been and where I am now, I've come up with a new title for my talks, which is, Can 
nice Polish Red Indian American girl find happiness in Arabia? The question might very well have been, what's a nice Polish Red Indian American girl doing in Arabia? For well, that is indeed a long way from Muskogee. But at this stage of my life, I can still say with pride, as I did at the age of three, I'm from Muskogee, Oklahoma, and proud of it. <laughs>